Uh, it's always somewhat of a, um, uh, I guess, of an enigma of a diagnosis to make, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, um, you know, can clarify a few things uh, as far as um, the um, pathophysiology as well as uh, phenotyping heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So, uh, in general, heart failure is a epidemic, as you all know, um, and affects uh, 8 million people in the United States uh, by 2030. Uh, the healthcare costs are going to skyrocket for HEFPEF, and uh, currently in 2012, uh, we're spending about $21 billion uh, for heart failure, and uh, by 2030, it will reach uh, $53 billion. And uh, HEFPEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, accounts for 50% of heart failure uh, in the population in the U.S., and it's growing by about 10% per decade. And the five-year survival, um, despite it being different than heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction, is still poor up to 50%. So, um, so first of all, we have this um, uh, diagnosis of HEF-PEF versus HEF-REF, and HEF-REF is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So what distinguishes these two entities? So what distinguishes these two entities? So first of all, HEF-REF is uh, classically defined as heart failure with an EF less than about 40%. HEF-PEF, uh, EF greater than 50%. Uh, in clinical studies, uh, the area between 40 and 50 percent has been variable, and in some clinical trials, they included 40 to 50 percent in those patients who had uh, HEF-PEF as well. And uh, one thing that um, I'll uh, reemphasize is that diastolic dysfunction is not invariably present. Uh, in all patients with HEF-PEF. So if you see an uh, echocardiogram that diagnoses diastolic dysfunction, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean this patient has HEF-PEF. Uh, so um, other characterizing, uh, other differences uh, with uh, HEF-PEF versus HEF-REF, one is age, and uh, these patients with HEF-PEF tend to be older, um, and as Dr. Coulter um, uh, pointed out these patients with HEF-PEF uh, tend to be predominantly female. They also tend to be hypertensive and have high frequency of comorbid conditions, uh, including obesity, metabolic syndrome, renal dysfunction, and anemia. And um, at this point, there is a lack of targeted therapies for HEF-PEF uh, versus uh, those patients with HEF-REF where we've got 30, 40 years of um, clinical trials uh, that guide our therapy. If you look at it from a macroscopic uh, point of view, uh, the uh, patient above uh, or the sample above is uh, from HEF-REF. What you see is ventricular dilation. Um, you have relatively lower wall thickness relative to chamber radius. Uh, so you've got a dilated LV. You've got higher filling pressures and that subsequently leads to increased wall stress and higher BNP uh, releases. HEF-PEF on the bottom tends to be uh, characterized by concentric remodeling as well as normal chamber size. And uh, these patients tend to have lower BNP levels than have ref. However, they tend to be elevated. So uh, epidemiology, we kind of spoke about the rising uh, sort of epidemic of heart failure as well as uh, HEF-PEF. And we can see here as with um, this slide here, uh, heart failure projections uh, into 2037 look like they're steadily increasing, mainly due to the aging of the population, as well as the increased prevalence of comorbid conditions such as obesity and hypertension. And if we look, uh, the prevalence of heart failure increases uh, with age, um, and um, uh, elderly females uh, will be um, more likely to develop heart failure. If we look at discharges uh, for heart failure, they have been steadily increasing over time. And uh, again, so far we have no uh, trial that's demonstrated efficacy uh, for HEF-PEF. Uh, 
And uh, in this uh, small cohort of patients who had uh, heart failure, we see that those patients who had, um, those patients with heart failure that were admitted, who were women, uh, predominantly had HEFPEF. So um, if we look at some of the temporal trends here, uh, this is uh, from um, uh, the Mayo Clinic study, and this was uh, sort of their initial, uh, probably uh, large um, epidemiological look at HEFPEF, and this was an article published in 2006, and that showed sort of the steady rise in heart failure preserved ejection fraction um, over a six-year period in Olmsdale County. And uh, on the slide um, over to the right, we can see that those patients, um, over that course of time, those patients in the black who had reduced ejection fraction had uh, decreased mortality rates, whereas those patients who had preserved ejection fraction had increased um, mortality rates. And uh, the uh, mortality with HEF-PEF versus HEF-REF tends to be very similar. And uh, this shows that over time that these patients um, with uh, HEF-PEF here really had no change in their overall mortality uh, from 1987 to 2001. If we look at a more contemporary study here um, uh, that looks at patients all the way into 2010, we see this ongoing um, increase in the amount of HEF-PEF. Uh, however, there may be a slight improvement in mortality, mainly due to a recognition of uh, comorbid conditions. So what is the pathophysiology and uh, phenotypic substrates um, that define HEFPEF? And I think uh, this is to emphasize that uh, we see a lot of patients here with diastolic dysfunction characterized by imp impaired relaxation, increased LV filling pressures, decreased compliance. And then we see these patients who have heart failure preserved ejection fraction. So again, um, diastolic dysfunction may be found in 70% of persons older than 70. However, those patients who have HEF-PEF, about a third of those may not have actually distinct TTE abnormalities. So when we use the term diastolic heart failure, I think we have to be very specific about those patients that have HEF-PEF who also have echocardiographic abnormalities as well. I think one of the um, growing things that is uh, being recognized is the importance of inflammation uh, in HEF-PEF. And um, what you have is sort of some underlying condition, these comorbidities that include obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and renal insufficiency. All of those lead to um, increased um, inflammation, including an upregulation of uh, your cytokines, um, marked by increased levels of CRP. And this inflammation or this um, system-wide inflammatory response <coughs> causes various derangements um, across multiple organs. And, you know, depending on your degree of involvement of various organ systems, that can define a particular phenotype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So one is the lungs. Uh, those patients may have uh, frank pulmonary hypertension that occurs with uh, HEF-PEF. Skeletal muscle disorders tend to be very key to HEF-PEF as well as exercise intolerance. Renal dysfunction we see a lot. And then um, on the uh, cardiac level and coronary level, we see significant endothelial dysfunction that ends up leading to uh, myocardial damage. So we can uh, phenotype these patients um, on the basis of, you know, what's really driving their HEF-PEF. And I think some of these patients you'll see who may be younger have type 2 diabetes and are obese. Um, these patients may need a particular uh, sort of treatment uh, uh, modality. Other patients may have arterial hypertension, perhaps your elderly female who has very difficult to control and very labile hypertension. And then there are those patients who have renal dysfunction as well as coronary artery disease as well that may require a different mode of therapy. So I think by phenotyping these patients, we can think about how to effectively treat these patients. So 
leading to HEFPEF then are multiple uh, derangements. You get diastolic dysfunction, we spoke about that. You get extra cardiac causes of volume, volume overload, including obesity, arterial stiffness, pulmonary hypertension, endothelial dysfunction, uh, chronotropic incompetence, as well as autonomic dysfunction. So on the myocardial level, you can see extracellular matrix abnormalities, including increasing uh, amounts of collagen, collagen type 1, uh, disordered cross-linking. At the cardiomyocyte level, you may see cross-bridge um, abnormalities. Um, Titan is a key protein uh, that's involved in uh, relaxation. Uh, mut uh, um, mutations in Titans can lead to familiar restrictive cardiomyopathy, but this may also be involved in um, disordered um, relaxation. Along with that, you get decreased nitric oxide availability as well that causes further derangements. These patients, subsequently, those patients who have increased fibrosis and um, impaired relaxation act differently than those patients with um, normal um, uh, hearts. And for a given amount of volume, you see higher degrees of LVEDP, so higher wedge pressures. And this is uh, a key characteristic uh, for HEF-PEF. The other thing you can do is characterize the amount of um, fibrosis and those patients who have HEF, uh, PEF may have increased fibrosis here, and this is an MRI study that showed that these patients had higher degrees of fibrosis. They had um, more echocardiographic um, diastolic abnormalities, and likewise on pressure volume loops, uh, they had uh, further derangements uh, leading to the uh, HEF-PEF syndrome. The other thing that you can see here, and this is uh, something that you may see in patients who are elderly, is ventricular vascular coupling or uh, uh, um, discoupling, actually. And um, what you have is that uh, generally you have to have um, your myocardium keeping up uh, with your um, arterial system. And, um, if your arterial system has higher afterload due to aortic stiffness, decreased compliance, and higher SVRs, it may pose a higher um, afterload to a already deranged heart that can lead to pulmonary vascular congestion and uh, exercise intolerance. Obesity is central and um, uh, uh, in heart failure. This is sort of a general slide looking at obesity and heart failure, uh, showing how adipose accumulation can cause multiple derangements, including sleep apnea, increased circulating blood loss. All of that can lead to various derangements that include pulmonary hypertension, uh, RV failure, as well as LV systolic and diastolic failure. Uh, obesity has been shown to uh, lead to LV remodeling as well, and we can see an increase in mass uh, with BMI. And uh, the other thing that it can lead to is um, multi-organ derangements uh, due to inflammation. So in the lung, you get a restrictive physiology, um, pulmonary hypertension, sleep apnea. In the heart, you can get uh, lipotoxicity, um, increased afterload as well as preload. Um, you can have <coughs> hepatic derangements, um, increase um, cytokine release through visceral adiposity, increase uh, renal dysfunction as well as skeletal muscle uh, dysfunction as well. All of that in the end leads to uh, worsening New York Heart Association class and worsening quality of life. And um, interestingly, these patients who are significantly obese, these are the patients that we see all the time in our clinic, they weren't uh, readily included in a lot of these HEFPEF trials. So there's not a lot of data for these patients. So um, diagnosis. Um, one of the things to think about is what is your differential uh, for these patients? Maybe it's not HEFPEF, maybe they have significant pulmonary arterial hypertension, maybe they have uh, constrictive pericarditis. One of the things to recognize is maybe the um, uh, a presence of infiltrative cardiomyopathy, and I think this is something that's been under-recognized 
quite a bit is amyloid. And we typically think of AL amyloid, which is your myeloma type of amyloid that affects the heart. But what's really been under-recognized is this transthyretin amyloid. And that's a mutation that's seen more and more predominantly in the population, and that can cause um, um, a restrictive cardiomyopathy. You can have a fam uh, familiar mutation of TTR, or you can have a wild-type senile form of it. Um, and these patients, it's important to diagnose these patients because uh, if you diagnose them early enough, you can always think about transplant, but there are a lot of interesting therapies that are being looked at um, uh, to treat this uh, disorder, including RNA interference drugs, uh, as well as uh, various NSAIDs. And um, although you can use MRI to diagnose it, um, you can also use uh, endomyocardial biopsy to diagnose these patients. It's all over the place, um, and two biopsy samples can diagnose uh, uh, amyloid. Um, Dr. Coulter is much better of a person to talk about um, echo uh, criteria, so I won't spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about echo, but it's obviously the essential first step in diagnosing a patient uh, who you think has HEFPEF after um, seeing if they uh, meet the clinical criteria. Um, we obviously look at um, uh, various parameters um, as far as the echo is concerned. I know our uh, guidelines change quite a bit, for, but for those uh, people who aren't uh, cardiology-based here, we can look at mitral inflow, um, we can look at tissue Doppler imaging, and uh, using that criteria, we can look at uh, whether a patient has diastolic dysfunction or not. Uh, and then based on those criteria, and these are from the 2016 updates, um, we can determine whether these patients have increased left atrial filling pressures and advanced diastolic dysfunction. Uh, so using these parameters, we can get a, uh, a sonographic idea of uh, these patients um, in uh, diastole. Um, uh, one of the other things to think about is the importance of strain imaging, and a lot of these patients uh, who have HEFPEF actually have uh, subtle systolic dysfunction as well that can be detected by strain imaging. Biomarkers uh, tend to be key as well uh, as far as the diagnosis of heart failure uh, with preserved ejection fraction. BMP levels tend to be lower in those patients who have HEFPEF, uh, and uh, that's uh, due to the lower wall stress. Uh, other biomarkers that uh, may be important that we don't routinely check include those that may be associated with uh, myocardial hypertrophy, interstitial fibrosis. Galectin-3 has gotten a lot of uh, sort of study press. Uh, we don't use that uh, um, typically in our practice, but it's a nice marker of myocardial fibrosis. Um, uh, other things that um, can be checked include inflammatory markers, as well as those patients who have suspected coronary disease, um, uh, high sensitivity troponin. And uh, based on these biomarkers, you can help guide um, a little bit of your therapy. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, if you have the capability, is uh, invasive cardiopulmonary testing. And uh, this is probably an uh, underutilized uh, method of diagnosing a patient who has um, uh, exercise intolerance and uh, dyspnea. Uh, basically, you um, get patients either on a treadmill or on a bicycle and measure oxygen consumption as well as carbon dioxide uh, production as well. And um, in addition to getting a sense of uh, what their respiratory capacity or incapacity is, um, there are some other centers out there, and this is actually some slides uh, from Massachusetts General, uh, that look at um, invasive cardiopulmonary testing where you can actually get a full assessment of uh, their physiology by placing a swan. And this is a patient here who um, had dyspnea and uh, had relatively normal resting hemodynamics on his uh, right heart cath. And uh, with exercise, actually, um, they had a significant increase in their 
pulmonary arterial pressures, um, as well as their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So all of that emphasizes not only the importance of maybe some degree of exercise testing, but also the importance of catheterization for these patients um, when you really suspect um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And um, this can be very key. Uh, we can look at those patients who have high PA pressures. Um, we look at transpulmonary gradients. That's the difference between your mean PA pressure and your wedge pressure. And in most of our patients with HEFPATH, they will have um, values less than 15 millimeters of mercury. Some patients, however, may have very high pulmonary vascular resistance, and these may, again, form um, a, uh, another phenotype of the HEFPATH population that have significant pulmonary hypertension. But I think um, without getting into too many details, catheterization for these patients can be very helpful. And I think it's important not to just do resting catheterization uh, assessments, but to think about volume loading those patients, especially those patients who have been fasting since midnight, and then um, doing exercise uh, testing to see if they've got in, uh, increases in their wedge pressures and their PA pressures. Uh, the other thing to look at is, um, again, uh, <coughs> carefully looking at the relation of your wedge pressure to your diastolic, uh, uh, to your PA pressures. And uh, this is something that um, uh, the pH group that used to be here uh, emphasized was this diastolic pressure gradient. And that's the difference between your wedge and PA diastolic. And these can identify those patients who have pulmonary hypertension. So uh, what are some of our therapies um, that we have for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And the answer is not many. So um, these were a couple of trials that looked at uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. The first was CHARM, and that looked at candesartan. This was a negative trial um, that uh, demonstrated no improvements uh, in their primary endpoints uh, with the use of candesartan. A few years later, um, Ibersartan was also uh, evaluated in a multi-center, multinational clinical trial, and that showed no improvement in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And I think, you know, part of the uh, main uh, large fallacy with these trials was that there was such a uh, phenotypic heterogeneity in the patients that were enrolled in these trials. So you had a lot of patients that had different reasons to have um, HEFPEF, and I'll get into that in a second with another trial. Um, so if we look at some of our other phenotypes before getting into targeted therapy, maybe we should look at things that we can actually fix. And some of the things that the Mayo Clinic and other areas um, in Chicago have emphasized is um, looking at um, risk factors. So one is CAD and AFib. In this study, they showed an improvement in revascularization in those patients who had HEFPEF. So uh, again, emphasizes the uh, importance of looking for coronary disease in these patients, because keeping in mind that relaxation um, is an active process. Also, those patients who had AFib tended to have increased levels of various biomarkers and worsening outcomes. And um, although there hasn't been a big trial looking at uh, restoration of sinus rhythm in those patients exclusively that have PEF, there are smaller trials showing that these patients will have functional improvements. Uh, as far as lung congestion is concerned, we can look at uh, diuretic therapy. Um, that tends to be one of these obvious things uh, that come to mind, but I think some of the things also is that our diuretic therapies um, may need to be looked at further. They're actually looking in the heart failure research network at uh, the differences with loop diuretics. One is torsamide versus furosemide, and it's thought that torsamide may actually cause a decrease um, in uh, inflammation and your renal angiotensin axis upregulation. Um, the other thing to look at is maybe the importance of uh, cardiopulmonary rehab in these patients. And this was a study at a JAMA. Uh, this looked at caloric restriction as well as um, aerobic exercise training in patients who had HEFPEF. And it showed that the combination of both actually significantly improved uh, symptoms uh, versus uh, placebo, or versus control, rather. Uh, 
Other things, statins um, may reduce inflammation in small studies. One of the things that's always came up until about 2015 was that, um, you know, maybe we should use nitrates in these patients. And actually in this study from Mayo, they showed that these patients actually did not benefit uh, from the addition of isosorbide mononitrate, and they actually did worse. Um, perhaps due to a uh, reduction in their stroke volume from increased venous capacitance. Uh, so nitrates are not quite effective in all HEFPEF patients, so you may reserve them for those patients who have CAD. So then how do we treat the fibrosis? So one of the big things, uh, big trials uh, that looked at this was the TOPCAT trial. And this was unfortunately a negative trial. This was a multicenter, uh, multinational clinical trial that looked at the efficacy of uh, spironolactone for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And um, their uh, composite endpoint, uh, spironolactone, didn't show any improvements. Um, and half PEF. But uh, one of the things that came out of this trial was that. Um, uh, again, getting back to the I preserved and the charm trials, that uh, the patients that are enrolled, there was a wide uh, variability in the patients enrolled. And in this trial, they actually looked and they found that uh, the patients in Russia and the country of Georgia actually they got in just because they were short of breath, uh, whereas uh, in the United States and the Americas, they were enrolled primarily due to BNP levels greater than about 400 or so. And in those patients who were in the U.S., they actually did better with spironolactone um, uh, than those patients in Russia who those patients actually had mortality rates that were equal to the general population. So. Um, and when they looked at the BNP levels, they found that in the I preserve study here, um, which was a 2008 study, that those patients who had higher BNPs tended to do better with ibrosartan. So I think it um, emphasizes the importance of really looking at these patients and seeing if they have volume overload, high BNP levels, and uh, fit a particular phenotype. And uh, you may consider some of these therapies that were proved uh, clinically ineffective. So one of the um, uh, sort of um, interesting things, I guess exciting things in uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction is neprilysin inhibitor uh, inhibition. And uh, neprilysin uh, is an enzyme uh, that breaks down uh, various um, uh, vasodilatory molecules, including uh, BNP. And uh, in a large trial for heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction, this is a Paradigm HF trial, they found that the combination of Valsartan and Secubitril, which is called Entresto, uh, led to clinical benefits uh, in heart failure, uh, so much so that a lot of us are uh, changing our therapies and no longer using ACE inhibitors as a first line for these patients. So then the thought is that will Entresto help um, in patients who have HEF-PEF? And they're looking at this um, in the uh, Paragon HF trial. So we'll see what that shows if there's an improvement in these patients. And I think part of the enrollment in, these pa in this trial includes BNP levels. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the results are. Uh, rounding out some of our therapies, heart rate and heart failure. Um, heart rate tends to be a key thing that we tend to focus on with heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. In general, heart failure is, uh, we know, in reduced ejection fraction is a bad thing. It causes uh, worsening heart failure outcomes um, through uh, various modalities. Um, in um, a large retrospective trial, they actually found that beta blockers may show a signal to improve patients with uh, HEFPEF, but again, this is a large retrospective look and we need um, uh, ret uh, prospective trials looking at beta blockers. Evabridine was something that uh, also was somewhat exciting, not quite as uh, exciting as Entresto, and uh, Evabridine is a specific inhibitor of the sinoatrial node, and it's been shown to be effective in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in those patients who are maximally beta blocked and have heart rates greater than 70. They looked at this uh, in small trials and conflicting trials and haven't shown any uh, major benefits of this drug as well.
One of the things that I guess I'm more interested in seeing uh, pulmonary hypertension patients is PA pressures, RV function, functional class. And the higher your PA pressures are, the worse you do. Uh, so sildenafil has been looked at for HEFPEF, and uh, PDE5 expression is upregulated in failing RV, so it's thought that in those patients who have significant RV dysfunction, um, uh, sildenafil and tadalafil may be effective um, because it upregulates um, or acts on cyclic GMP and can serve as an uh, inotrope in uh, these patients in addition to uh, pulmonary vascular um, uh, resistance reduction. However, in a trial from uh, 2013, they showed no improvements uh, with the use of uh, sildenafil, but again, I think it emphasizes the importance of trying to characterize these patients a little bit more clearly by cath. Do they actually have pulmonary hypertension in addition to their HEFPEF um, <coughs> leading to their symptoms? And maybe these patients subselected will benefit. Uh, another drug that's being looked at is Riasiguat. It um, bypasses nitric oxide and works uh, directly uh, on uh, cyclic GMP. Um, and uh, there are ongoing trials looking at this drug. So finally, um, you know, we'd like to intervene on patients. Um, so what are some of the interventional modalities for HEFPEF that we have? Well, one of the big things that we're doing uh, for HEF-REF is um, cardiomems, and this is an implantable PA catheter. Um, it takes like 10 minutes to put in, it's pretty simple. And um, it basically gives you a readout of the PA pressures, and we've done this quite a bit in patients who um, are frequent flyers to the hospital uh, for uh, decompensated heart failure. And the, and the um, basis for this is that elevations in volume PA pressures actually precede from like one to two weeks any sort of heart failure symptoms. So you can actually uh, preemptively um, reach out to these patients, increase their diuretics, and guide their therapy using PA monitors. And uh, in the CHAMPION uh, trial, they showed, um, interestingly, an improvement in mortality rates with the use of um, PA monitors. And it's important to note that in this trial, they actually included both HEF-PEF and HEF-REF. So these patients who have HEF-PEF, who keep on coming into the hospital with heart failure symptoms, something to think about in these patients is uh, cardiomems. Uh, this is interesting. This was something that you know, they were doing in Europe, but this is a, um, a device that, look, uh, that actually creates a um, um, uh, left atrial pop-off, and you implant this uh, um, via transeptal approach, and it basically gives you a one-way left atrial, right atrial uh, shunt that actually unloads the left atrium, and this was looked at uh, this is a phase two study showing uh, feasibility, efficacy, and safety of this device. Um, and uh, we'll see in phase three trials if this may help uh, patients uh, both with heart failure with preserved and reduced ejection fraction. So uh, I think finally to uh, finish off, it's important to recognize uh, comorbid conditions. One is sleep disordered breathing and the fact that OSA and CSA is very um, central to a lot of patients with HEFPEF. And there are no clinical trials looking at these patients, although um, Adaptus um, uh, servo ventilation, which actually gives you ventilation at the time of detected apnea episodes, um, actually has been shown to um, maybe improve patients who have systolic um, heart failure. Uh, other things to look at are treatment of other things such as anemia, diabetes, renal dysfunction, as well as obesity. So in conclusion, HEFF is a growing epidemic uh, due to the increased prevalence of comorbid conditions that contribute to the system, uh, especially obesity, aging, uh, hypertension, and diabetes. Uh, phenotypic distinction of HEFPEF can guide therapy. And then central to HEFPEF may be inflammation and systemic event, uh, effects. Echocardiography can help diagnose HEFPEF, um, but diastolic dysfunction does not equate to HEFPEF.
And there are limited therapies for HFPEF, and I think it's important, though, that uh, we try to phenotype these patients, look for some of the zebras, such as amyloid, um, uh, and uh, treat their comorbid conditions.